Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Mary Kimball. I'm the CEO of the Center for Land-Based Learning, and I'm really excited today to be here with, with two great friends and one new friend that I've only recently just met uh, in the last month or so. And we'll get started soon with Michael Bosworth, Toki Sawada, and Carol Barsati. But first of all, I'll do a little quick uh, share of my screen to talk a little bit about um, what this whole Green Tables Chats thing is. And uh, so here we are, it's May 7th, 2021. Hard to believe our last one was on March 26th. And this whole goal here with the Green Tables Chats uh, is, is to have these conversations with local farmers producers, restaurateurs, and really to kind of explore all of the different pieces of this region and our, um, and our great production and sustainability measures that so many, of, uh, so many farmers and restaurateurs and many other companies in the food business are doing. Uh, this is a, a program of the um, La Dame Escoffier and the Sacramento chapter, and you may say, well, what in the world is La Dame Escoffier? <laughs> and it's an organization uh, that's actually international. And, and as you can see here, the, we've got the mission and vision up on the screen, but honestly, it's, it's all about, um, as, as you can see, to inspire and advance and support women uh, in food, beverage, and hospitality, agriculture, and leadership, and philanthropy. And we have a great local group here in Sacramento, and we are very proud, one of the very proud chapters from across the, literally across the world. Uh, and we're really getting, I mean, it's been going now for over five years, but now this group is, is really, working hard to share more education and philanthropy about all of these things. And I do want to point out that, that Carol is also a local dom and uh, we are in the process of bringing in a whole new group of, of women here in the next couple of months. So we, we hope to continue to be a real source of education and philanthropy for women in this, in this region. So again, I just really want to say thanks for joining today. Uh, obviously, you're all muted and there's no, your cameras are not on, but of course, we'd love to hear any questions and feedback. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to type your question and your host, that's me, <laughs> will do my best to get to all of them. Uh, the best thing to do is just type the question and I will, and I will answer it. So. Um, that's my hope anyway. I won't answer it. I will, I will ask the panelists to answer it, but I just wanted to give everyone a, please do ask questions and you can ask them at any time. It's totally fine. This is a pretty informal group and, uh, and we love the questions. So they make things way more interesting. So Michael, we're going to start with you. And again, this is my good friend, uh, Michael Bosworth, and he is a true entrepreneur and farmer. And as most farmers are also true entrepreneurs. So he is, he's got a few businesses. Um, his, his, one of his businesses, Next Generation Foods and his new business, True Origin Foods. So he's the CEO and owner of, of both. But where we are right now is literally with him in a rice field. So we're going to start, Michael, with you. Give us a little description of, of uh, where you are and what in the world you're doing right now in the rice in the rice country. What's going on for you? Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah. So I'm in the East Nicholas area right now. Uh, I have an organic rice field down here that we just uh we just planted organic jasmine in it last year and uh, had a really nice crop and we're getting ready to do the same thing this year so um on this field i had a, a vetch cover crop that i planted last fall that's a legume so it's a nitrogen fixing um plant and uh so that that turned out really well i i chopped the vetch and then uh dist, dist it into the soil three times 
uh, to incorporate it. And then we just applied some, after I did that, I leveled the field with a GPS scraper. And then we applied some fertilizer, organic fertilizer yesterday. So today I am incorporating that fertilizer. Let me turn my camera around. And then also um, rolling it afterwards. So uh, this is my tractor, we're out here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, this, this tractor has these little chisel points on it. It's kind of like a cultivator. So those go down to the ground and they you know incorporate the fertilizer into the soil. And then this roller goes behind it to put grooves in the field. So the, when we plant the rice, the, the rice will settle down in these grooves. So this is kind of the last step um, for planting uh, this field before I uh, apply the water. So that's what I'm up to today. So, so let, yeah, so let's talk about water because I think, you know, over the years, uh, you know, growing up here and, and being a part of this region, I've often heard, you know, rice farmers use so much water. Why are we growing rice here? This is crazy. So can you talk a little bit, Michael, about really, you know, how much water you actually apply and, and really some of the sustain, again, rice, um, what, what rice needs in terms of water and being flooded. And, uh, and, and also we're in a drought year. So talk a little bit about how, how that's affecting you and where do you get your water? Talk about that as well. Sure. Yeah, so gen generally we get most of our water uh, either out of the, the Yuba River, which uh, comes out of Bullard's Bar Reservoir um, or we get it out of Camp Far West, uh, which is kind of east of Wheatland. Um, and that's for the South Sutter Water District. We also have a field over in the Robbins area that gets its water out of the Sacramento River. So uh, we've had curtailments, um, you know, reduction in supply of water from all three of those areas this year. Um, so, you know, in general, since we can use surface water for almost all of our needs, um, we, we still have wells. And so in these drought years, we're able to use our wells to, you know, kind of augment our needs for, um, for our irrigation. So, um, since we're not using them every year, you know, we're recharging the aquifer in the years that we're not using them. So we monitor the, you know, the groundwater level on a regular basis to make sure that we're not impacting, uh, the aquifers in a negative way. Um, but as far as water goes, you know, the reason that all this rice is grown north of Sacramento is because a lot of the soil is pretty, pretty bad. Uh, it's really heavy clay soil with a hard pan that's, you know, less than a foot down below the, the top soil. And uh, you can think of it as like a bathtub. So you see a lot of water out in a rice field, but there's not a lot of percolation that happens with that water. And uh so it holds it really well and, you know, it's, it's comparable to a lot of other crops when you work out what the production is in the field compared to how much water it uses. Mm -hmm. So how many inches, like how many inches of water, Michael, when you're putting that water on the field, how, what, we, what are we talking about? Are we talking about feet? Or are we talking about, you know, a few inches? What, what does it need? Yeah, so we're in, uh, you know, in general, about four inches of water is on the field throughout the growing season. This organic field, we put more uh, because we can't use any herbicides. And so water is our herbicide. We drown all the weeds and the rice is pretty resilient. And we plant about twice as much seed on the organic field as we do on the conventional because you're going to kill some of it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, water is our main weed control mechanism on the organic. So it's a little bit deeper, um, at least for the first 30 days. So then once we get all the weeds killed, we can kind of lower it down a little bit. Yeah, you know, I love that, that uh, those trade-offs, right? People talk about the wanting to have organic and, and what does that mean? And, or, you know, not using synthetic herbicides. But that, what that also, though, means for you as the farmer is it means that you have to put more water on it. <laughs> because yeah. you can't use a synthetic herbicide. So, I mean, I love that because it's these trade-offs, right? That, that you can't look at something in a silo in just one yeah. way. There's, there's all of these different things that you as an organic farmer have to do in order to not use synthetic herbicides. And sometimes that means yeah. that, you know, 
Uh, some of these things that maybe people don't like as much, like you have to use a little bit more water. Well, those are the trade-offs. So yeah, yeah, and it's you know if you if you do the math on it, it's actually not a not a ton more. It seems like mm -hmm. it would be, but your factors are you know crop use is going to use water, percolation is going to make you know water go away, and so is evaporation. And so whether you have two inches of water or 12 inches of water, all those factors are the same. It's just that initial flood up that takes a little bit more. Um, you know, the other thing with this organic field is that the fertilizer is about twice the cost as the conventional, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm 700 bucks an acre and a fertilizer just for this field. But again, I don't have to spend any money on herbicides. So, right. you know, that's, right. that's another trade off there. Absolutely. So hey, let's let's switch over a bit to the other side of your your world, Michael, which is um, you know which is distribution. So you you got into, I mean, you started out as a rice farmer, but why did you move into the distribution side? Like, what was it for you that made you want to control <laughs> your food, your product, you know, literally all the way to the almost to the consumer? What what was what, why did you start doing that? Yeah, so I, uh, I went to Davis and I took a class, uh, agricultural marketing, and did a project on rice, organic rice, and uh, kind of walked through the value chain from the grower to, you know, the end consumer and saw, you know, who was making money along the way and, you know, how much money was possible to extract from that supply chain. And so uh, the first thing I wanted to do was just create a brand and sell our rice to customers because that was, you know, step one. And I soon found out that the most important step of the whole process is getting it to your customers. And, you know, it's, it's really a challenge to get into a distributor. You know, you need a certain amount of customers as a base, you know, for a purchasing um, that would attract a distributor to even want to carry your product. They're not in the sales game. They're just, in moving product and so uh, it's hard to get buyers if you don't have distribution so it's it's pretty tricky so anyway we started selling and couldn't couldn't put that together and so i just started uh, next generation foods and started distributing uh, out of my pickup truck and uh, had a warehouse in west sacramento where i could pay uh, cold storage um, for the rice on a per pallet basis so i didn't have a lot of you know, fixed overhead, it was all variable. And uh, yeah, from then on, you know, my customer base kind of grew. Uh, UC Davis was probably my biggest first customer. They did, we were doing the rice for all the, the coffee house on campus, so then all the dorms. And so the volume started kicking in to where, you know, that, that was working well. And then all my customers were asking for any other products I could find for them. So what are, you know, what are your neighbors growing? What else can we get? Can we get walnuts? Can we get, you know, whatever it is. And so then it was, it became kind of an aggregator and a distributor, kind of like a food hub. And uh, so, yeah, now we have a warehouse in West Sacramento and we're still doing the same thing. We have, uh, uh, we just have brought on another employee. We have four employees um, full time and uh, yeah, just trying to grow that business also. That's great. So, and we'll talk with Toki here soon on the restaurant side, but um, before we switch to her, I, I always find the story, uh, Michael, of how you kind of got going in the Sacramento restaurant market and, and who some of your original buyers were and, and they taking a chance on you. So. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just tell, tell, us, tell us a little bit of that story because it's I think it's an important one for people to know about. Uh, and again, going back to restaurant owners and chefs who really want to know where their product is coming from and why they would buy from someone like you. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, one of our very first customers was Billy at Crew. Uh, we're, we're both the same age. We... Um, you know, he was getting going. I think I was, I was 2006. So I was like 25 and he was opening his own restaurant. And anyway, we, I'd kind of been hounding him for a while and uh, finally had him come up for <laughs> harvest. And he, you know, wrote on the harvester and 
got to see what we were doing and then you know he's he started buying immediately and we're still serving him today at all of his restaurants um same with randall selling he and his wife came up and josh uh, had you know uh dinner at the ranch and a tour there and and we're still serving them today as well and you know it was it was great uh i learned a lot early on from them uh just about you know how, how important high quality local food was for them and uh you know that that was really a cool relationship um and you know Bill even encouraged me to grow a, a premium short grain rice organically. He, he said, look, I, I really like your medium grain. It's great. I'm mm -hmm. trying to elevate what I'm doing in my restaurant and this is what I need. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, we're, we'll grow it and, and try it out. So that was kind of the first time I, I listened to a chef to you know, <laughs> what I'm doing, but that was early on, but you know, to change what I'm doing on the farm. And since then, you know, we've, I've listened to my customers and we're growing basmati and jasmine and long grain and all kinds of other varieties based on that feedback. And I think that's really an important component of running a successful business is being able to have that direct relationship with your end, end consumer to, to do what they want. You know, that's, that's, that's my job. So. Well, that's a perfect segue and I do have there is one question that that someone asks and I think I know the answer but I'm going to let you answer it uh, Michael which is is all rice gluten free and maybe someone else maybe Toki can also answer that question too yeah yes it is yes it is <laughs> yes awesome okay so Toki we're going to move over to you and I'm so so thrilled to be able to get to know you this last um month or so. So I've yes. heard about you and I've heard about your 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 and, and your incredible restaurant Thank you. Yaki, in Sacramento that you co-own with your husband uh, Craig mm -hmm. Takahara. And so tell us a little bit about it first, Toki. First of all, thanks so much for being a part of today. Oh, thank and you for we'll, including. And, uh, we'll talk about the rice side, but talk tell us a little bit about the restaurant first. Well, my husband and I met 20 years ago um, at a culinary school. And ever since then, uh, we've been together. So we've been married 12, been together 20. And we always had a dream of opening a restaurant. So after school, we were, you know, working at restaurants, working at different types of restaurants. And we always had the goal of opening a restaurant, but never knew what it, we wanted to do or where we wanted to do. And as we were getting older, you know, I never uh, visited Sacramento before. And so we started dating and he brought me up to Sacramento and it, it it's a, a quaint town and compared to LA. So I was like, wow, yeah. like this, this city is definitely more family oriented than LA. So we decided to move up here to start a family. And when we moved up here, you know, we ate around and we wanted to open up a restaurant and we wanted to open up a Japanese restaurant, but we didn't want to open up another sushi restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, because we noticed that Sacramento was pretty dense with a lot of sushi restaurants. Um, so our idea was to open up more of a Japanese comfort food, or as we call it, a Japanese soul food. Mm. And it, I grew up in Japan half of my year for 20 years. So mm. I went to school here. And once school finished here, I, we flew back to Japan for three months. And we lived there for three months. So I did that for 20 years. So like, it's almost like growing up here half and in Japan half. And we knew exactly what kind of food that Sacramento wanted and needed. So um, my husband also trained in Japan too, to do the sumiyakis, um, to do Japanese food. So it was a perfect uh, idea. And here we are now, five years later, um, we chose Old Town, um, Japantown, because mm -hmm. we wanted that Japantown to to revive again. So we, when we were looking for our location, we really didn't want to go anywhere else. And our 
place was an old rickshaw, another Japanese restaurant that was there for 20 something years. Um, the gentleman decided to uh, retire and it was a premium donut shop for a while. <laughs> so um, as soon as we it. heard those doors were closing, I literally walked in there and I said, hi, nice to meet you. I know you're closing. Can I please have the landlord's phone number? Oh my God. I love <laughs> but, that. Yeah. So, you know, we had that location in, in place for a longest time, but it was like, oh, we wish we had that location. And, and, and that one day when we heard that it was open, it was just like a dream come true. So um, here we are, you know, serving Japanese soul food. Um, we're, we're so happy that, that the Sacramento people get to taste what Japanese food is not just sushi and teriyaki, you know, it, there's more to it. So um, it's, oh, and, it's pretty awesome to be when here. When I talked to you a few, a few weeks ago, you said to me that you started buying, you know, obviously Michael's rice from day one. And, and so mm -hmm. what, why, why is that? And why, you know, kind of the other side of the coin, why do you work with a farmer like Michael? What does that mean to you and mean to the restaurant and to your, the quality of your food? Well, Sacramento, you know, is surrounded by so many, you know, farmers, not just with rice too, but with mo lots of vegetables all year round. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we had our restaurant and concept, it's like, well, why not use the most freshest ingredients, you know? And so when we're able to talk to customers, it's like, yeah, well, you know, this rice was literally just grown like less than 20 miles from this restaurant mm -hmm. or these carrots were just harvested this morning and it's right on your table. And, you know, it, the ingredients are so fresh that it doesn't need too much work to it because it has its own magic. You know, we're just helping to bring out the flavors, bring out more of the quality of each ingredient, because these products that we have right around here in Sacramento, it's just so fresh. There's nothing more you could ask for. Mm -hmm. and, and we wanted, you know, we serve the organic short grain too, just like Billy. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people think our rice is softer but we chose because it was more glutinous. Um, mm -hmm. The more you chew, the sweeter it is. And um, Osaka area where I grew up, we eat um, shorter grain rice, a little bit more glutinous. So we cook it a little bit softer than a regular sushi rice. So it actually adds a different profile to it. So it doesn't, that short grain doesn't have to be just sushi rice, but you know, soaking it in, in, in water for an hour before you cook it, changing the ratio slightly with the rice. Mm -hmm. It adds a different, you know, uh, uh, flavor profile. And my kids eat it at home too. And, you know, not just the short grain we use, we use uh, Michael's uh, jasmine rice to mm -hmm. uh, basmati rice, whatever we serve at home to and the brown rice. Um, we we change it, but we, we stick to Michael's rice because it's it's grown here. It tastes really good. And and it, it's just farm mm -hmm. to fork. Absolutely. And do you have I mean, do you have would you say that your customers is that something that they really value? about about your food that they know that it's coming from local farms and that it's about part of your menu and all of those things do they ask you about rice production the, those kinds of things do you ever they, have to answer questions <laughs> they do actually and and we actually learned a lot from customers too because mm -hmm. Uh, they tell us their preference um, how they like their rice or they even come and say you know how do you cook rice? Mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, they, they come and they ask how they, um, they cook their rice and we teach them how we cook their rice and they'll come back the following week or in a couple of weeks. And it's like, wow, like I never knew <laughs> rice could be this fluffy, you know? <laughs> so not only we're able to, you know, show them, you know, they get more interested in cooking and mm -hmm. we serve 
uh, Michael's rice, but right now we also serve, uh, sell his uh, bags of rice uh, in oh, our restaurant too. Oh my gosh, wow. So customers who like our rice, you uh-huh. know, they buy some. And some families, they buy a big 25 pound bags too. Um, so it's it's really nice. And and it, what we, we built relationships to a point like a lot of Sacramento people also bring their produce to like a customer. It's like, you know, I have so much lemon. Can you use them? Or like we harvested so much lettuce, we can't eat it all. Can you guys use it for the restaurant? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's it's a it's more than a restaurant it's like building a community building a bond between um family and to another family and and our restaurant is all about uh being together with people so you see customers that don't know each other start talking to each other at the end of the night and they're exchanging numbers they're exchanging information um, I have a one regular, he's in the agricultural business and, mm-hmm. and he tells us so much information about the farms and the econo- uh, economics and the environment. And we learn so much from that. And it makes us be more careful with our restaurant too, to handle these vegetables and these farms, because, you know, without them, we have no food to put on our plates. So it, it, it's really a great circle that we get to see. Well, thanks so much, Togi. I love I loved that. I had no idea that you were selling uh, the rice as well in bags at yes. the store that are at the restaurant. That's amazing. And that's actually a perfect segue because you talked about the home cook and you talked mm-hmm. about how they want to learn about how to how to. Uh, cook rice better <laughs> or in different ways right and they're like yes. there's many different ways and it's true I'm I'm probably very basic in the way that I that I cook my rice and I'm sure there could be I could be doing a lot better with it so Carol that brings you into the equation so Carol Barsati a uh, longtime friend and local Yolo County l- woman, uh, head of marketing and customer experience for Farm Fresh to You and uh, her family's farm, KP Organic. So you are on the, the home side of the equation. So, t- so talk to us, um, Carol, about, first of all, what is Farm Fresh to You and, and KP Organic and, and where did this whole uh, business come from? Give us a little background. Yeah, so um, a little bit about Farm Fresh to You. We're a a CSA or a a, a box delivery service of organic fruits and vegetables. Um, Our customers subscribe to our company and they get a a box on a set frequency. That could be every week, that could be every other week. Um, And at the core, it's a mix of fruits and vegetables, um, some grown on our farm, KP Organic, um, and then we do aggregate from other farms. Um, and we deliver those boxes to customers' doorsteps. And so they, we actually take them to their home. Um, and they're intended to meet a family's produce needs for the week. So you can you know, get a, a bigger box size if you have more people in your household or a smaller box and if you have less. And then we operate through the state of California. So our farm um, is in Cape I, I, I laugh when you say that um, Sacramento feels quaint because compared <laughs> to UK or Sparto, it feels like a metropolis. <laughs> but, um, and, and we have a facility in West Sacramento where we aggregate the produce. That's where I'm, I'm sitting right now. Um, and then we have a similar facility in, in Los Angeles, in, in Vernon, where we aggregate produce from Southern California, some that we farm in Southern California and then from other local farmers. And then we will deliver, you know, the local produce to the local customers um, throughout the state. Um, So we're a little bit different than a a traditional CSA and and we have been since we started. Um, You know, we have a a pay as you go model as opposed to, uh, you know, pay for a number of shares up front. Um, We've always delivered directly to customers' homes. That's how um, my mother-in-law started the the service. and we've always had um, a little bit more of an ability to customize what comes in a produce delivery. Um, but, at, but at our core, we're farmers um, and we've always used our service to connect, you know, what we can grow on our farm to consumers and to have a, you know, a sustainable, um, you know, income stream for our farm. 
So when did you start adding in, I'm trying to remember myself, when you started adding in some of the other kinds of value added products, because I remember that being kind of like earth shattering, like, wow, we can get more than just veggies in our veggie box. When did that happen? And, uh, and when did you start adding in the rice piece of it? Yeah, so that's been over the past, I'd say five or six years. So we've been, we've been delivering to customers' homes since 1992. Um, we've you know, our, the family's been farming organically since 1976. We were founded as an organic farm um, very much because my, you know, so Martin Barnes and Kathleen Barsati founded the farm. They had been grad students at UC Davis, and they really had a project to start the Davis Farmers Market. Um, and, and we're afraid that they weren't going to get any farmers to show up. And so they rented a small plot of land and they started farming. And so that's very much how our family, um, you know, got into farming and, and they've been organic, you know, since they since they started farming. Um, the business has been run by the second generation, you know, since Kathy passed away in 2000. But, you know, and I think through that second generation, you know, we kept a lot of the core values of um, really what Kathy had been trying to do when she started Farm Fresh to You, but, but really looked at how we could use technology to connect differently with consumers um, and to not only connect them with, you know, our farm and what we could grow, but with other local producers. And so, um, 2014, I'd say ish, um, is when we created an online technology where, you know, we build a seasonal mix and what we think is kind of the best seasonal selection for the box every week. Um, and then customers can go online and they can see what we intend to send them. And then they can take out things they don't like or add things that, you know, work better for their meal planning for that week. Um, and then along that process, we realized that there was a demand for, you know, things in, in addition to fruits and vegetables, and that we could use, um, you know, the way that we tell our story and the way that we connect, you know, our farm with consumers to do that with other farms. And so um, I'd say the last five or six years, we've been working with, um, you know, Michael um, with his rice. And then more recently, we have, you know, some dried beans and popcorns and, and other things that customers can add. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's funny because you all are telling a similar story about how you've listened to the customers. So Michael's listening to his restaurant customers or, right? <laughs> and, and, and changing the way that he's, who, what he's planting for them and working in concert with them. Toki is listening to her customers and, and saying, you know, what is it that you want? Oh, you want to be able to buy this rice? Okay, we can do that too. And then, so what do you do, Carol, to in, in terms of gathering information from your customers and what do you hear from them in, in terms of wanting more or, or learning more about how to, 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 uh, to correctly cook it? Those kinds of things, how do you interact with them? Yeah, so, you know, we, we have a pretty direct um, relationship with our customers. We, um, you know, in addition to, you know, we write a farm news that goes in the box every week. And so we can connect customers with what's happening on our, and on our farm. Um, and that same, you know, included sheet would have recipes for things, you know, you know we send them kohlrabi. Well, not everyone knows how to cook kohlrabi. And so we, we try to give them, you know, tips on how to store the produce or the products. Um, and then, you know, also how to cook it. Um, you know, we, we bring our customers, you know, in a, in a non-COVID environment, we bring them out to the farm for tours and for festivals. Um, and I think it was really through those conversations um, that we, we realized that, that there was a demand for more than just fruits and vegetables. And, you know, where we've built more um, product selection into our service, I think, you know, our customers have told us that you know, it's, it's hard to go to the grocery store and, and easily make choices on, um, you know, what foods meet your values. And so, you know, we don't have a traditional shopping experience. You can't, you know, you can't buy from 10 different rice brands. You can buy, you know, Michael's rice from Farm Fresh to You because mm -hmm. we know him as a producer. We know what his sustainability practices are. Mm -hmm. um, and then customers, you know, have told us that that, that is a helpful um, tool for them because they don't have to do a lot of thinking when they choose to buy a product. They know that we have vetted it. And, mm -hmm. and then a, in addition to that, when a customer, um, you know, goes online to, to make a purchase, if they're going to add Michael's rice to their box, you know, they can click on the product and they can see where it was grown. They can see a, a you know, a photo of the producer or the farm. Um, you know, we highlight the growing practices so they know that it's, you know, non-GMO verified and they know, mm -hmm. um, you know, just a little bit more details about sustainability. They know that it's a family owned business and, 
And those are all values that we know are important to our customer. And so when we're looking at who producer partners, um, you know, who's, who's an appropriate fit for Farm Fish to you, it, it's very much based on, on, on how local they are, kind of what their ownership structure is, what their sustainable, what's, you know, sustainability or growing practices they have. Um, so that, so that the overall product mix is very true to kind of our, our, you know, our initial core value of, you know, sustainable farms connected to consumers. And you, I'm assuming you're kind of always looking for um, new products to add and, and uh, you know, and how, yeah, what is that vetting process? Like what does, what does Farm Fresh to you do in order to, you have an audit? Do you, what are the kinds of things that you do and in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, traceability and, you know, making sure that the, what the farmer is saying is what you're getting. How do you how do you make sure that that that's all true and and that uh, again the cons the consumer is getting what you've said that they're getting? Yeah, I mean we are a small family company, so you know that I, I wear a number of hats. Product selection <laughs> is one of my hats, um, and I think it, it very much has to do with just the relationship that we have with the growers. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, so obviously things like. You know, organic, well, there is a standard and that's something that is, you know, audited or not audited. Um, but for other sustainability practices or, you know, just kind of, you know, the, those other core values and beliefs, it, it's just a matter of knowing the farms and having enough of a, of a relationship and a connection and, and that we've been out there and that we've, we've actually met the producer and, and that we can trust um, based on what we've seen and, and based on what we know about the business um, that what we're saying is, is true. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny, it just reminded me when you were talking about COVID and um, last year, you know, when I remember the ships, the ports were, and I think there's still probably a little bit of that issue. Literally, there was like a run on rice, right, at the grocery stores. Mm -hmm. And it was mind boggling to me because people were so freaked out that, that we wouldn't be able to get rice in. And I was like, so you do understand, right? That we grow rice here in YOLO, in, you know, YOLO, but also in the Sacramento Valley that we have rice in California. And, and there were so many people that I spoke with, which again, to me is mind boggling. Uh, we're farm before capital. You think people understand, but really don't. I mean, you fly in and you see the rice fields, right? But really didn't have an understanding that, that there was rice grown in this region. So you two also, Carol and Toki, I mean, you're also helping, right? To, to tell the story of these, the, of this rice growing region and how important it is. And this is, for our food security, right? That this region and a soul food, like you said, Toki, right? That that this comfort food, rice, is is local here. We can depend on it. We can de and we have this this connection to the farmers right here in our own region that are growing it for us in healthy ways. And Michael, we didn't even talk about the the environmental piece of the. And if you if you can come back on, I know you probably, you might be driving. But talk a little bit about, uh, if you could, Michael, the, the environmental side, the fact that these beautiful rice fields also happen to be habitat for literally millions of waterfowl. Um, talk a little bit about that, because that's another thing I think that we, we tend to forget in this process is that these agricultural fields and specifically rice fields in this region at different times of year our incredible habitat that they wouldn't have if it wasn't for rice production. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, yeah, as Mary was saying, the, the habitat component is, is a big part of, you know, what all rice farmers are doing out here. So we grow rice from, we're in the field from the middle of May, uh, March until the end of November. And then after that, um, you know, we're, we're flooding the field or, or chopping and disking the field. And there's a, couple hundred pounds of rice left over in the field that either falls off before it's harvested or you know it comes out the back of the machine and so there's there's a food source there for migratory waterfowl and shorebirds and then there's also kind of uh quite a few aquatic invertebrates that that thrive in rice fields during that time over the winter and provide a, a big food source so you know about 95 percent of the wetlands in california are gone and so um California rice fields kind of act, 
act exactly like a wetland for you know the Pacific Flyway, which is which is a pretty big deal. Um, been a, a couple other neat programs uh, over the last four or five years in California rice. Uh, one is a partnership with the Nature Conservancy to provide uh, habitat for migratory shorebirds at key times in the year. So uh, real early in the season and, and harvest season in September, uh, there's kind of some incentive-based programs to, to get your crop harvested and, and get a little bit of water across those fields to provide habitat during the migration of the shorebirds. And then the same thing in the the late winter, early spring, just leaving that water out on the field a little bit longer than you normally would want to, um, you know, just because it's preventing you from getting into the field to, to start your crop crop year. But it also provides a great, um, uh, you know, source of habitat for those birds. So then the last program that's really neat and innovative is uh, for raising uh, juvenile salmon on rice fields. And so that's that's shown some really promising results, 400% um, uh, increase in uh, survivability of those juvenile salmon uh, getting out uh, to the ocean underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. So looking forward to kind of expanding that over the years. And um, there's, there's a, a pretty good chance that the NRCS will be able to define a conservation practice for that and, and provide the funding necessary to really grow that from a pilot project to something that's more of a, a scaled project so yeah thank you Michael I know I love I love the Nigeria project and and all of the different and folks I can uh, will have to send out more information if people are interested in the the salmon piece it's fairly fairly recent in the history of all of the environmental side of things that that rice farmers are helping to provide but you know it's just amazing to me to think about that Again, these, these rice fields, uh, which again have the tendency, if you just look at it in one, in one silo, it's like, oh, they use so much water. Well, <laughs> in, in actuality, all of this water is, is providing uh, habitat for such a, incredibly important species for our biodiversity uh, in this state and certainly the northern part of California. So again, thinking about what that water provides and, and how important it is, not just to grow the food, which of course is, is number one, but also to help support so many different incredible diversity of species. So we had a, a one of the, another question that came up uh, from Michael for you. So do you have any, do you sell, your, is any of your rice sold in supermarkets or grocery stores in this region? We heard about you can buy it at, at Bin Shoyaki, and you can buy it if you get a CSA box from Farm Fresh to you. But how about good old fashioned rest or uh, grocery stores? Yeah, so uh, currently we're in the Davis Food Co op, but in a couple of weeks we're going to be in Rayleigh. So uh, pretty excited about that. Yeah. That's a big move for us. We've, you know, for the last 15 years, we've primarily been a food service. Uh, you know, distribution business, um, that's where we could move volume. But when COVID hit, you know, our business was basically dead in the water. Um, and, you know, thanks to Carol and her team for, you know, really, uh, you know, they needed a bunch of the, the stuff we had and we needed them uh, mm -hmm. a lot as well. And so they pretty much uh, kept us rolling throughout the last year. It's been really really a great relationship and we're thankful for that and and it really kind of opened our eyes to what the opportunities are in a retail size bag and so we started <laughs> um, a new brand called true origin foods and we're really excited about it it's uh, we have you know really beautiful packaging and and uh you know great marketing and a great story and uh so yeah we're excited to to kind of uh, jump into the, the retail space and the brick and mortar space. So, Perfect. Well, there you go, Sue. Pretty soon, it sounds like you'll be able to buy it at uh, Rayleigh's Bel Air. So that's, that's a wonderful addition and it, very exciting, Michael. And that actually is a perfect segue into um, another question for all of you, which is, you know, kind of what changes did you see most in the last year with regards to purchasing habits? 
for Toki, of course, the restaurant side, how did, you know, really, how did things change? What were the biggest changes for you and, and how have you adapted to that? So why don't well, we start with it? Go ahead, Toki, why don't you start? Okay. Yeah. Um, so as soon as COVID hit, you know, like you said, the rice were flying off the shelves and, mm -hmm. and there was a rice shortage. And <laughs> so my thought was, it's like, well, all these people are storing rice. And they probably don't have much things to eat the rice with. Mm -hmm. So um, we started to sell our curry or our beef stew or um, things in a bigger tubs, like a bigger portion. And it was freezer friendly. So they had enough rice at home. So all we needed to supply was something that they could eat the rice with. So that's one thing we started um, during the pandemic and also changing our price point uh, to a, a smaller price point, something that's more affordable uh, from a $5 dish to a $20 dish. So to, to use more of the great rice, we started to sell $5 rice balls. Um, and it's packaged with the seaweed on the outside and all they have to do is they purchase it and it, there's a certain step that they could take so the seaweed goes freshly on the rice mm -hmm. and and so that's been flying off the shelves so you know really shifting to to the bulk items to a smaller price point so more people could afford you know eating out really helped us survive and still be able to buy, you know, from farms mm -hmm. to sustain all of us. Wow, that's, I really want you in Woodland now, Toki, because so could you just open a new restaurant <laughs> in Woodland? Somewhere in Yolo County, that would be amazing. <laughs> I'm so jealous for folks in Sacramento that get to go to your <laughs> Thank you. restaurant on, on a regular basis. So Carol, Thank what you. about you guys? We heard a little bit from Michael about that shift and how Farm Fresh to You was so critical really uh, for them to be able to sell to you. And, and, to, and so what other kinds of things did you see in this past year? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we are in the food delivery business. And so, you know, that, that demand really um, had an uptick during COVID. Um, but we did see, you know, where we've carried Michael's rice for a lot of years, you know, I wasn't convinced that someone wanted, you know, 32 ounces of dried garbanzo beans, um, but they do, or they did during COVID. Um, and so, you know, it really allowed us to expand some of the more pantry items that we may have, you know, we may have been a little bit more hesitant to because, you know, we've always kind of focused on things that are perishable, like produce and things that you need to get on a, a frequency. Um, but it, it was an interesting, you know, particularly early in COVID to see I think it really demonstrated the value of, of the local food system. Mm -hmm. And as some of the distribution channels started breaking down, um, you know, we didn't have that same problem because we could call Michael directly and explain what we needed. And, you know, and, and we could work through and solve that problem. And, you know, he had more products that we wanted to buy and, 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 and really work that out as, you know, particularly in those early days when, when you were watching the grocery stores really struggle to, to figure out how to, to change, um, you know, based on that that pretty dramatic con consumer mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Michael. Anything else to add from from your side, from the farmer side, with regards to big changes in in uh, consumers that you've seen, maybe on the even on the distribution side? Yeah, it was it was pretty intense. So, like maybe a week before they locked everything down or 10 days before there was supposed to be a big natural food conference, the biggest one in the world down in LA, Anaheim. And I was supposed to go to his Expo West. They canceled it like two days before it happened. And so mm -hmm. I went anyways and looked <laughs> online to figure out, you know, who I could go see down there. And I ended up in the city of industry and I stopped at a, a whole bunch of um, kind of Asian trading companies that, specialized in importing rice and you know told them about our rice and the jasmine and this and that and they're like oh yeah that's that's cute we can buy this stuff out of thailand cheaper and whatever and you know i gave them my card and about 10 days later they were calling me left and right because they had already sold out of all the rice they had and they had you know 
100 or 200 containers coming over, but they weren't going to make it in time. And so mm -hmm. our warehouse went from having, you know, 400 pallets of rice in it to having zero in about 10 days. And we were able to, you know, mill rice and kind of keep it coming in as we needed it. But yeah, it was, it was pretty wild. And, um, you know, we were packing rice and beans and all kinds of stuff for, for Carol and, and uh, we we're able to bring in some folks, you know, from the restaurant industry that, mm -hmm. you know, couldn't work. And so that was really kind of an interesting, you know, relationship there too. And they, they shut everything down. And so we had people that, that needed something to do and we needed, you know, people to help us too. So, mm -hmm. um, and then we, we also have an online store on our website and that thing went crazy too. So, um, you know, it was, it was pretty wild, but, you know, overall, um, we were able to kind of stick together and, and, uh, keep everything going, but it'd be nice when things get a little bit more back to normal. <laughs> more back to normal. Well, I you know, I guess one question that I have, and I think I'll, I'll leave it for another green tables chats. And I, I've been seeing it a lot on Twitter and otherwise, which is, you know, we, we, people did kind of lose, um, faith right in the supply chain and like oh my gosh our supply chain broke down so quickly and they went to these local channels and they were so appreciative and yeah I'm going to go to my local farmer and local CSA box and so on and those some of the and and you know the question is will they forget about all of that and will they stick with the local supply chains the regional supply chains that they trust and they know or will they go back to the cheap jasmine rice from Thailand or whatever it might be. Now, I think that's a, a lasting question that we have, right? To see what, what, what lasts and what people appreciated and said, you know what, this is maybe it is a bit more expensive for these reasons, uh, but I want to invest in my local community. I want to invest in my local restaurants and businesses and farmers that are helping me stay alive and stay healthy during this time. So we'll see, right? I think that's an interesting question, but I'm starting to already see people online saying, we've just lost you know, 50% of the CSA customers that we brought on last year. Uh, and these are smaller CSAs um, you know, that, that were real resilient, it could be real resilient and quick to respond. You know, I don't know whether or not we'll, and, and now they just lost 50% of their business. That's, that's, that's very interesting to me that, that people are forgetting so quickly, right? So uh, on that note, anybody have any final thoughts before we say goodbye? I really appreciate your time. I've, I've taken up uh, an hour of your time this morning, Toki, Carol, and Michael. And, and I just really hope that all of those who've been listening in, watching in, have learned something very new today about rice and, and about uh, our wonderful local supply chains and traceability and why it's critical to support them. Any, well, any I, final, final thoughts, Toki, from you? I, I just want to say um, my friend picks up food from her school and one of the boxes they get on Mondays that had Michael Bosworth's rice in <laughs> and and he's I everywhere thought, he's everywhere <laughs> that was amazing because you know sometimes farm to fork becomes a privilege mm -hmm. when it should be available for everybody mm -hmm. and to see Michael's rice in that box was so heartwarming mm -hmm. to see to show that everybody could eat farm to fork. Yeah. And a lot of people who are not able to eat that farm to fork cannot be educated because they don't have that knowledge. And so to see that, that bag of rice in that box gave hope to these families in the future because they might read that package and realize like, wow, this rice is just grown right in this neighborhood. And, and that could even spark an idea to, to start shopping farm to fork. So, you know, as us being able to have that knowledge with farm to fork, I think we should continue to educate 
you know, not only that to people who already knows farm to fork, but to go to communities that farm to fork is not available. So um, yeah, to see to see that bag of rice in that box was was a sign of hope mm. that we all need. Thank you. That was perfection. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm sure Michael appreciates that as well. Uh, okay, Carol, what about you? What would Kathleen Bar be saying about all of this? I don't, you know, I don't know. It's, it's hard to, you know, things have changed so much um, in the last couple decades. But, um, you know, I think it's just inspiring to see how the local food system has flourished, you know, in, in Sacramento. You know, 20 years ago, you know, it was a very different scene. And so I, I hope we continue to see that develop. Agreed. Agreed. Here's to the local food scene. Okay, Michael, you got any final thoughts for us on the, on the tractor? How many more hours of tractor time do you have today? <laughs> uh, this field, probably an hour and a half. And then I have a seed field, a couple of seed fields I have to go put, put kind of like a buffer strip in. So I have to put mm -hmm. some other seed in between the two of them. So they don't get over, uh, over seeded with different varieties from the airplane. So. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't get to see the airplane today, but uh, that'll be, a, that's, that's a, for, for folks who don't know how, how rice is grown or planted here, it actually is flown on by small airplanes. <laughs> yep. They're all over the place today. They're so all over, crop duster yeah. style, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I just, you know, thank you for the opportunity and, and thank you to Carol and Toki for, you know, mm -hmm. supporting our farm and, uh, you know, we're looking forward to working together for a long time, so. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. The threads or the ropes or the binds are strong here, and I love that. So thank you, everybody. And thanks for everybody who joined us today. If you have any questions, you're welcome to email me, mary at landbasedlearning.org, and I'm happy to connect you as well if you don't already have connections with these three lovely panelists. So thanks, everybody. Have a great Friday and good Mother's Day weekend. Thank you. All righty. Bye. Bye.